Okay, uh, thank you very much and uh, good morning uh, to all those who have tuned in. So today we're going to reflect on the topic of uh, wise attention. And I think uh, Bobby mentioned the Pali word, Yoniso Manasekara. Right? If it's too long a word, don't worry about that. <laughs> so basically we're going to talk about uh, what is wise attention. I think first of all, we you know, should always re reflect uh, why are why are we studying or practicing the Buddha's teachings, right? So I think it's good to remind ourselves to study Buddhism is actually to study the mind. Yeah, to study the teachings of the Buddha is actually to study our own mind. And to be able to practice the teachings of the Buddha means that we are actually transforming our minds, our mental states towards uh, phenomena or whatever that is uh, wholesome, positive, right, and, uh, and skillful, okay? So that is where the topic of uh, wise attention comes in. So I think before we look into various uh, aspects of this topic of wise attention, uh, primarily taken from the Pali Suttas, I think we should perhaps for a start understand three very important aspects of the mind. Right, to understand this topic much better. I think the three topics are consciousness, mindfulness, and wisdom. Okay? Now, consciousness, as we all know, is a simple act of knowing, well, at least from the Buddhist psychology. So consciousness basically means uh, knowing different sense objects, which uh, kind of include subjects of the mind. Now, this is the ordinary knowing as we as we move throughout the day, okay? And uh, our consciousness is usually conditioned by many of our reactions, mainly our sense impressions. And for human beings, sometimes we have this word, loss in thoughts, okay? So this is what we would call ordinary consciousness, which is basically simple knowing. Now, when we study Buddhism, we find that there's another word uh, which comes into play, and that's mindfulness, or sati, right? Sati, mindfulness. Now, mindfulness is when we become aware that we are knowing, all right? So with mindfulness, or if I could use the word interchangeably as awareness, then we are no longer uh, uh, so caught up, carried away by stories of our mind. And by that inner narration that goes on so often in our mind. So then we become mindful enough to see and observe what's going on within us and also in the world around us. Sometimes those of you who have practiced meditation or practiced mindfulness, you may have heard the, the, the instruction that to be mindful means whatever objects that arise, do not react to it, okay? Uh, so, but what is important is, is that mindfulness by itself is not enough, okay? Uh, I don't intend to go into details of what is mindfulness or what, how we practice mindfulness, but just to, just to give you an overview that mindfulness is really when we become aware that we are knowing, right? I think you, you, you're gonna have a talk by uh, Saile Kama, two weeks time, about what is not mindfulness. But what is important to realize is that mindfulness by itself is not enough. As, late, as later on, I will try to cover these this aspects. Now then the other aspect is wisdom. Now, once awareness or mindfulness gets steadier and stronger, we become more mindful. Actually, mindfulness then becomes a platform for wisdom to arise, right? So it is not enough just to have mindfulness, as I said. We want to use mindfulness as a platform for learning something that we are observing. What are these that we are learning? Is there an investigation, right? Those of you who have studied Buddhism, you, you know, one of the seven factors of enlightenment is investigation, Dhamma investigation. And this is what that would lead to the growth of wisdom. And when we talk about wisdom, we are essentially, from the Buddhist perspective, we're talking about understanding the Noble Eightfold Path uh, in the context of the Four Noble Truths. All right? So today's topic, uh, something for us to reflect on is that when we say wise attention, or wise intention is to understand how our mind works and to direct it wisely, all right? So that it leads to 
something uh, positive, something wholesome, and something skillful. Right? So that's the, the very essence of what we will discuss today. Now, I'm just going to maybe show a couple of slides. But first, let's see what this word actually means. Yoniso, right? Yoniso manaseka. Uh, this is one of those uh, Pali words which has got many meanings, right? So the word yoniso actually comes from the word yoni, all right? Uh, it's a common word which is found not just in Buddhism, but also in, in, uh, in Hinduism. So it actually means from the womb, right? So from that word, you get birthplace or origin. So that is the essence of core of a particular method. So later on, we will see what, what this word means, right? In the context of some examples, which I will show. And mana sekara from the word mana, the word mano, right? You know, the Malay word that we have, matnusia. Matnusia, which means a human being, right? So the word matnusia from the word manu, mano. So the, same, so the, 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 the same root word, so which means a being with a mind. So we are human beings, so that's why we are matnusia, right? So we are a being with a mind. So the, from the word manu. So manusekara means to do something in mind or direct the attention. Okay, so that's how you kept this word, yoniso manasekara. So, so, so when, when we say the manasekara, so it is really just attention or bringing the mind to an object. But when you combine with the word yoniso, then it becomes like a special observation, right? So it is said that the, the, the minimum for it to be called Yoniso is that the effect or attention uh, that the mind has is on something that's always positive also. For example, if you are easily, when you get upset or you get angry, uh, that is improper attention, right? So that's not Yoniso Manasekra. In, in fact, there's another word, it's called Ayoniso Manasekra. So it's the prefix, it means it's the negative. Okay? And, and I think those of you who have studied the Bidama. So he says that every moment of consciousness is also accompanied by attention. So the challenge for, for us, even in our everyday life, how do we get it focused through wise and wholesome lens? How do we ensure that whatever we do in our everyday life, right, is focused through something that is wholesome, that is skillful, that is positive? Okay. So I, so I think that's just uh, to give you a background of how this word come, comes about. So the key word is uh, yoniso and then the word mana, mana from the word mind. So to direct the mind on an attention or something. So now uh, I've, I've got some other explanations here. This is from Prayuto. Right? He says that a mental factor that assists in the birth of wisdom and is consequently of great importance in vipassana. So, so uh, the wise attention will help us to uh, will lead to the arising of wisdom, the birth of wisdom, the yoni from the, from the womb. So from the womb, you get wisdom. All right. So how we direct our mind that leads on to wisdom. And uh, Payuto says it is consequently of great importance in vipassana. And, and, and vipassana here means to uh, insight, isn't it? seeing things as they really are. As we move on, then we'll see what does the Buddha meant when he says to see things as it really are. Now, it is also defined as a skillful means employed in the efficacious use of wisdom as it opens up a space in which wisdom can mature. Right? So that's, that's the, other, the other explanation. Now, what is key is, as I think I mentioned in the, at the beginning of, this, of the talk, is that uh, it links mindfulness and wisdom. So you have consciousness, you have mindfulness, and you have got wisdom. So that is why you, you find that you have got these three very important aspects when we talk about wise attention, right? So as I mentioned, mindfulness by itself is not enough, all right? It is never enough just to have mindfulness because when you're mindful, you're merely reacting to, uh, to, a, to a phenomenon, okay? But when you... Uh, when you complement mindfulness with clear comprehension, that's where the wisdom part comes in. So that's why in the, for example, in the discourse called the four uh, frames of reference or the four, uh, the four satipatthanas, the four foundations of mindfulness, the, the Buddha talks about uh, three very important things. And mindfulness is never alone by itself. Mindfulness is always accompanied by 
clear comprehension. Okay, so when you have when, when you're mindful, that mindfulness, instead of reacting, then you're able to respond with clear comprehension. Now that clear comprehension is, is, is the wisdom part. And later on we will see what is meant by the wisdom part. Now, for us to have mindfulness and, and clear comprehension, there's another very important element there. And in the Satipatthana Sutta, this calls on the four foundations of mindfulness, you see another word there, which is called atapi, which is ardency. Now, this is that aspect of effort. You must always have effort. Sometimes you, you know, sometimes you, maybe you practice mindfulness and, and, and then the, 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 the next moment someone says something that's unpleasant, immediately you get upset, immediately you get angry. So where's that mindfulness? So that mindfulness, you immediately react to that unpleasant word. So mindfulness is, is gone. And that's, that's because we, we tend to forget, right? So we are forgetful. In fact, the word sati, actually, if you look back the word, it also means memory, remembering. So remembering what we should do. So forgetfulness. And how do we overcome forgetfulness? So one way is we always uh, cultivate effort or atapi, which is in the Satipatthana Sutta, it's described as ardency. The other words, you can say, if you put in the right effort, putting determination, aditana, that's the other strong, uh, strong word that we use in the, in the teachings, right? So you need three, three aspects. You need mindfulness, you need clear comprehension, and then you need to be always on guard, always with the effort is always there. So when all these three things are in, then you find that uh, you have, you actually there's wise attention you need to this. All right, so in the Noble Eightfold Paths, so these are what you call the Samadhi uh, factors, isn't it? You got right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. Okay, so you can see they are actually complement each other. Right? So then with wise attention, or Yoni Somana Sekara, we ensure that our mindfulness is based on clear comprehension, and we always have this uh, effort there to ensure that uh, it is always there, that we are not forgetful of that mindfulness. Okay, so this is the one, one way of looking at wise, wise attention. Now, the other way of, of, of understanding why, uh, wise, why wise attention is important is that uh, in the teachings, it says that wise attention is thinking in terms of causal relationship, right? Example, the consequences of one's thoughts and actions or exploration of the conditions, nature of phenomena that leads to insight and wisdom. Now, when we talk about causal relationships, I think immediately it comes to mind the law of dependent origination, right? The law of the, the 12 aspects of the law of dependent origination. In fact, uh, in the, in the uh, Maha Hati Pado Pama Sutta, which is the greater discourse on the simile of the elephant's footprint, uh, you may recall that Venerable Sariputta says, one who sees dependent origination sees the Dhamma. And one who sees the Dhamma sees dependent origination. Right? So you can find this. Uh, uh, so Venerable Sariputta explained this in the Maha Hati Padoma Sutta is in the Majjhima Nikaya, Sutta 28. So here, <clears throat> the Buddha explains about in terms of causal relationships. So in other words, for us to be able to, to reflect, to reflect on the dependent origination, right? that itself is a form of Yoniso Manesekra, is, a, is, a, is an example of, uh, of wise attention. In, in fact, the, the other uh, popular saying which we always find in the teachings is that with birth as condition, aging and death comes to be. Right? So that's in the Pachaya Sutta. Right? So in the Pachaya Sutta, uh, which is in the, uh, in the, in the book of Connected this Discourses, the, the Buddha explains that with birth as condition, arising and death comes to be. Right? So the common saying is that Birth is the forward view of death, and death is the backward view of birth. Right? So here again, you, you see in terms of a causal relationship. Right? So Yoniso Manesekara then, wise reflection, is 
It's a reflection that is built on observing or seeking to understand how things originate through conditions. Right? So if you remember the, the, the word uh, womb right, or the origin, so that's how uh, from that word itself, you have this uh, built-in explanation. Okay? And uh, in the teachings, it's also mentioned that the Yoniso Manesekara or wise reflection is an essential factor helps one to progress through various stages of the noble if we pass through Nibbana. Now, in, in fact, there's a, there's a discourse itself called the Yoniso Manasekara Sampada Sutta, uh, which is also in the book of uh, Connected Discourses. Uh, the Buddha here mentioned that because oh, this is the forerunner and precursor of the, arise, of the rising of the sun, that is the dawn, so too, because if this is the forerunner and precursor for the arising of the Noble Eightfold Path, that is accomplishment in wise reflection. And when a bhikkhu is accomplished in wise reflection, it is to be felt expected that one will develop and cultivate this Noble Eightfold Path. So for us to understand the Noble Eightfold Path is very important, but we must, like all things in the Buddha's teachings, we must always reflect Right? Reflect on the uh, Noble Eightfold Path. The, the reflection is always very important. So he says that it's a forerunner, it's the precursor right, of the arising of the sun, that is the dawn. So too, because this is the forerunner. Now, when we talk about Eightfold Path, we are, the wisdom part is actually the right views, isn't it? There are two aspects. And here, in another two discourses in the book of uh, uh, Gradual Sayings, the Buddha explains how we can, act, how we can actually uh, uh, practice uh, having, right, having wise, wise attention. And he mentioned two things here. So first, you have uh, what is called Parato Gosha, which is one of the two conditions. What are the two conditions? One is listening to another person. Right? So this is gosha, that means parata gosha means listening. For example, listening to a Dhamma talk, lis listening to, to, uh, to the Buddha's teachings, for example. So it is one of it. So that by itself, and then we reflect. When we reflect on it, so it will lead to right views. Okay? So you also re remember that in the Buddha's teachings, it says that when you contemplate wisely, right views rises. And once arisen, it goes. Now, how do we contemplate wisely? So we start by uh, listening or by studying the Dhamma. So listening to the Dhamma is what is called parato gosa. Right? So, and through listening to the Dhamma, one level of wisdom arises. So it is a, it is a preliminary level of wisdom. Right? In, this, in, this, in the text, it, it is called wisdom that arises through listening or studying the teachings. Sutta Maya Panya. Now, once we have studied the teachings, once we have, uh, uh, we have listened to it, we have studied, then we should uh, contemplate on it. We should think, we should reflect, we should analyze it. All right? So this is where the Buddha says, if you do that, then you, uh, then you develop or you cultivate a second level of wisdom. All right? And that is called wisdom that, uh, that arose through contemplation or through thinking or through reflection. Right? In Pali, it's called the Chinta Maya Pane. Right? But that again is not su sufficient. That the, the, the ultimate wisdom is something that we experience through our own, uh, own intuition, to our own intuitive experience. Right? And that is where through, uh, through our meditative experience. For example, we talk about, uh, about kindness. Right? So, we put it into practice, we practice kindness, and, and then we reflect on kindness. So when we actually practice it, we experience kindness. Right? So that is the, the experiential aspects of wisdom. So that's the third level of wisdom. And the, and the Buddha uses the word bhavana, bhav, bhavana maya panya. So it's wisdom that arises as a result of experience, of experiential uh, learning. So three, three levels here. So right views, all right, right view. So it says that in the Anguttara Nikaya Book of One, when you contemplate wisely, 
right view arises. And once arisen, it grows. So, so I repeat, how does it arise? It arises through step one, through listening or studying or reading the teachings. Secondly, through thinking, through reflecting, through analyzing it, the teachings. And thirdly, through experiencing the teachings. Right. This morning, you recited the five precepts. Okay? So the first, you, 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 you listen to why it is important to keep the precepts. You listen to, to talks, you listen to teachings, or you may have read some writings about the importance of the five precepts. So, so we listen. So we say, ah, that's, that's something good. So that's one level of wisdom. Then we practice it. All right? When we practice it, when we practice or when we observe the five precepts long enough, then it becomes our second nature. We experience the benefits of five precepts. Right? So, it, so it progresses stage to stage. Right? That's why the second phrase, as you can see there, it says, when you contemplate wisely, right view arises. And once arisen, it grows. Right? So practicing the, the teachings is, is, is like uh, giving exercise, right? It's like when we exercise, you know, in our body, if you have never been, been doing any exercise, and you find it for you to walk, maybe uh, 10 minutes, you feel tired. But through regular practice, you know, from 10 minutes, you, you can expand it to maybe 20 minutes, and then 30 minutes. And then after a period of time, through regular practice, you can even walk for one hour in the morning without feeling tired, right? So similarly, in our spiritual practice, when we try to uh, exercise our mind, so we exercise what is called our mental muscle. So when you exercise your mental muscle, it is said that uh, once it is there, it grows. Once you practice it, regular practice, that it becomes uh, more regular, okay? So that's the right view. So it, it, it's very important for us to understand the importance of right view. Now, in, the, in another discourse which the Buddha gave, he explains, now when we talk about right view, specifically what are we talking about? So we can look at right view in terms of three aspects. I think I've just mentioned one about uh, the, the Four Noble Truths, the Law of Karma, and then actions have results. Actually, all these things is, uh, you can sum up in one word, the Law of Causality. All right. So the, 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 central, the central conception of Buddhism or the central teachings of the Buddha is actually about causality. Early on, I mentioned dependent origination. But you can see the concept of causality. All right. You can analyze, for example, in the Four Noble Truths itself. All right. The first Noble Truth itself is the result. The second Noble Truth is the cause. The third Noble Truth is the effect or the result. And the fourth noble truth is the cause. So even within the four noble truths itself, you can see uh, the aspects of causality. So in the Mahachattarisaka Sutta, the Buddha says, uh, everything starts with right view. Okay, so first we need to comprehend or understand what is meant by four noble truths. Now, law, karma, actions have results, in a way, they are also similar. Law of karma is also a law of causality. For every action, there will be results. All right? That is why they say that actions have results. So that is the understanding of right views. And uh, based on the Buddha's own uh, experience, Bin's own understanding, he discovered that actions which are, uh, which are wholesome, which are skillful, they lead to results that are likewise wholesome and skillful. For example, he, give, he, he, he said things like uh, when there's kindness, when there's generosity, these are wholesome actions. So when, when, when such actions are performed, the effect, the result tends to be wholesome, tends to be positive. Right? So that's what the Buddha discovered. And because it's something that the Buddha discovered, he says that, all of us, we can also have that. We have the ability to discover the same thing. All right? That is why in the, 
one of the six characteristics of the Dhamma, of the Buddha's teachings, one of the words is Sanditiko, to be realized, each one for himself. All right? And because of that, the Buddha invites us to come and see, to come and view it, to come and uh, analyze it, to come and study it. So as you can see, all these points to the, to the aspects of the importance of reflection, not just mere belief. Now, in, the, uh, in, in many discourses the Buddha gave, he actually makes between two types of attention or two types of reflection. One is called wise reflection. This is Yoniso Manasekara, which we've been talking about. And the other one is unwise reflection. Now, in, in this aspect, we will be able to know what happens when wise reflection arises and when unwise reflection arises. Now, this is what the Buddha mentioned here. He says that if there's wise reflection, the nature of reflection or the nature of attention, how we focus our mind. If we focus our mind wisely, the Buddha says it results in right view of the nature of existence. And likewise, if you reflect unwisely, it results in wrong view of the nature of attention. Later on, we will see what is the implication of this right view and wrong view. So, here he says, for one who reflects unwisely. So he said, if you reflect unwisely, what will be the results? There will be anxieties, there will be troubles that have not yet arisen. While those that have already arisen, they increase, they just proliferate. But for one who reflects wisely, he says, anxieties and troubles that have not yet arisen, they do not arise. And those that have already arisen, they disappear. So this is a very strong statement that the Buddha made, right? Now, you, now I'm, I, because of time, we do, I do not have, have the opportunity to go into details, but you can read this uh, very uh, beautiful sutta, it's called the Sabah Sava Sutta, the discourse on all the things. In this discourse itself, the Buddha talks about how one can overcome all those defilements that arise in our mind. He talks about, I think, like seven, seven methods there. Okay, so the details you, you can read. That. I, I just highlight a, an extract from this particular discourse where it talks about what happens when you reflect wisely and you do not reflect wisely. Okay. Then in the same discourse, the, uh, uh, the Buddha explains that getting rid of anxieties and trouble is possible for one who knows and sees not for one who does not know and see, right? What must one know and see in order to get rid of anxieties and troubles? Okay, so here the Buddha is now moving to the next stage. He's saying that, yes, I mentioned, if, you, if, you have, if your attention is not wise, what is the result? You have anxieties, you have worries, you have fear, you have, you have a lot of, uh, of, of negative thoughts that arise in, in your mind. But he says that for those who know and see, you can actually uh, get rid of all these anxieties and troubles. So let's see what does he, he mean by that. So what is it that we need to, 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 to see or what is it that we need to reflect? Now, the first three, I think uh, all of you are very familiar. You have heard of this phrase the, that the Buddha talks about the three characteristics of existence as impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and non-self. The fourth one, what is not beautiful, is uh, I see it as it's kind of an addition to explain all the first three. Now, the, the, the very first aspects of impermanence, I think this is a very important uh, teaching. It is quite unlike any other religious uh, uh, teacher, the, the Buddha uses or teaches the topic of impermanence, or if you like the word change, all right? Uh, in the Thai forest tradition, Achan Cha, he likes to use the word uncertainty, all right? He says, uh, everything is uncertain, not sure, all right? If you read uh, Achan Cha's writings or you listen to, his, to, his, to the talks by his disciples, like Achan Amaro, Achan Sumido, they, you know, they will, they will always use or they will share what uh, their teacher, Achan Cha, 
would have taught them always about uh, that the phenomena is always uh, changing, uncertain, right? So impermanence, I think the Pali word you all know is anicca, right? So this is a very important word that, uh, that actually sums up the very essence of the Buddha's teachings. Now, um, Lady Sayadaw, I think some of you know, uh, maybe many of you have heard of Mahasi Sayadaw, but there's this Lady Sayadaw who, who lived, I think, in the early 1900s, early part of the 20th century. He has this uh, great instruction where he says, not seeing arising and passing away is ignorance. Seeing all phenomena as impermanent is the doorway to the stages of insight and awakening. So that is the direction we should shape our mind. That is the direction we should wisely tend to situations. Okay. So I think that's a very powerful statement which I which I always try to remember from Lady Sayadaw. I repeat that, I think it's worth remembering. Not seeing arising and passing away is ignorance. Seeing all phenomena as impermanent is the doorway to the stages of insight and awakening. And that's the direction we should shape our mind. At the same time, when we talk about the impermanent, we must not see it in a negative way. All right. In fact, His Holiness the Dalai Lama uh, used, to, used to say that uh, the, the great thing, the wonderful thing about impermanence is that our defilements are impermanent. Our negative thoughts are impermanent. Are impermanent. Imagine if, if there's no impermanence, all our defilements, how are we going to transform our defilements? But because the nature of all uh, or phenomena are impermanent, we can transform them. Likewise, we can transform our defilement. Okay? So we can look at impermanence in a positive way, not in a negative or pessimistic way. Okay? And in the Buddha's teachings, he goes at length to, to explain the, the, the paramount importance of impermanence. Okay? I just want to share with you a very beautiful discourse which the Buddha gave. It's called the Velama Sutta. Velama Sutta is, uh, is found in the book of, uh, of Gradual Sayings. It's a book of nine, I think Sutta number 20, because it talks about a hierarchy of, of, of uh, merits. You know, uh, in, 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 in Buddhism, we always talk about the importance of merits, isn't it? The, the, more, uh, the, the, the more generous you are, the more meritorious you, know, uh, you will receive, the more merits you will receive. So this discourse called the Velama Sutta, the Buddha actually gave to a lay person called Ananda Pindika, one of his lay supporters. Uh, there, there are nine, nine, nine things there, so I'm not going to go through the nine aspects of the hierarchy of, of merits, right? But I just picked, a, picked two, two or three very important points. For example, on generosity. In this discourse, the Buddha talks about the great benefit of practicing generosity. And there's no question about it. Right? And generosity, as we know, it becomes more profound by the purity of the giver, the gift that we are giving, of course, and the receiver. For example, you want to give something to the Buddha. It's like planting seeds in a very fertile soil, and there'll be tremendous abundance. So there's no denying that generosity is, is paramount, it's important. In fact, in the Buddha's teaching, we always talk about Dana, sila, bhavana, Imp uh, about giving, uh, morality, and then uh, meditation. So there's no, there's no question that generosity is important. But again, just as earlier I said, mindfulness is very important, but mindfulness is not enough. <laughs> mindfulness alone is not, is not enough. So likewise, generosity, while it is very good, it is not sufficient. Okay. Then the Buddha gave an example. He says, better than giving to the Buddha and the Sangha. All right, this is found in the Vela Masutta. So Buddha says, better, even more meritorious than giving to the Buddha and the Sangha is one moment of absorption in loving kindness, or one moment of metta that is even more meritorious. All right. So 
Buddha is not denying that generosity is not. But you perform generosity, but but if you perform metta, if you practice metta, loving kindness, even one moment of absorption in metta, that is even more merit. And then the Buddha said, then even more meritorious than one moment of metta is one moment where there is direct seeing of the rising and passing away of phenomena. So to whatever degree we see impermanence, it is a tremendous, powerful insight. Right? And the Buddha in that discourse says, even you see impermanence like in the, as long as a finger snap, a finger snap. Right? So that is the importance of understanding the nature of impermanence. But as, as I said, please remember that when you look at impermanence, it does not mean that you, you, you look at it in a negative way. Right? It can be seen as positive because our defilements are impermanent. That is why we are able to overcome them. Now, the other aspect, of course, will be unsatisfactoriness, which uh, I think a lot have been discussed about Dukkha, the Four Noble Truths, right? It talks about unsatisfactoriness, non-self, right? and what is not beautiful. So, uh, as I said, they are all different manifestations of the same aspects of impermanence. Why do people, uh, for example, we feel un- when, when, uh, when something pleasant arises, we cling to it. We want it to be uh, continuous for as long as it is. There's something pleasant. Right? So because of that, we cling to it. But can that pleasantness be there forever? Something that we like, can it always be the, be the same? It can never be. Right? Something that we do not like, instead of cling to it, the result is aversion takes place. Right? But at the same time, we can tell ourselves that something that we do not like, how long can it stay there? It is also impermanent. So it will also go away. So we need not have to feel uh, too upset or overwhelmed. Right? Okay? So, so unsatisfactoriness or the feeling of unsatisfactoriness is directly linked to the fact that Things that we like do not stay the way it is always. All right? So they're clinging to something that we like, that impermanent, right? is impermanent. And that is also because of that view of self, non-self. Right? We look at non-self as non-self. Okay. okay, so that is just some of the, the, the examples when we said what to reflect. And how do we reflect? All right? So we so we, we come to another aspect here. Okay. How to reflect. So here he says that does it lead to self-affliction or to the affliction of others or to both? Is it an unskillful activity with painful consequences? If on reflection you know it leads to self-affliction, affliction of others or to both. It is an unskillful activity with painful results. Then it is inappropriate for you to do so. But if on reflection, you know it does not lead to self-affliction or affliction of others or both, it is a skillful activity with happy results. Then it is appropriate for you to do. So here the Buddha sets out in very clear instruction. Whatever we do, and when and we talk about actions, we always talk about actions through three doors, to the mind door, to our verbal door, to our mouth, to our speech, and through our body. And it is said that that's where karma is created. So karma is created through body, speech, and mind. So how do we reflect an action that will appear through body, speech, so how do we apply wise attention into an action? So here as a broad guideline, anything when carried out, it leads to pain, it leads to suffering, it leads to uh, painful consequences for oneself or for others, for oneself and others, we should avoid. If that action that we perform, either through body, speech or mind, leads to beneficial results 
lead to useful or helpful results, then it is appropriate for us to do it. Okay, so that seems to be the general guideline that Buddha gave. Right? And uh, it's interesting in the, in the teachings, the Buddha actually gave this discourse to his son, Rahula, when he was uh, very young, in seven years, eight years. Okay, so I'm, so I'm going to, to share this. This is from the Ambala Tika Rahulo Vada Sutta. This is Sutta 61, right, in the Majjhima Nikaya. Now, this is an advice the Buddha gave to his son, Rahula, on how do you cultivate wise attention. Now, we can use this in our everyday life, in, at work, you know, dealing with our family members, dealing with our colleagues. We can, we can use this. I think this is a very, very appropriate instruction on how we, uh, we could lead our, our life using wise reflection. Okay, so it, it says first, uh, you, we reflect, we ask ourselves, will this mental, verbal, bodily action cause harm to me and others? This is in the future. Something that you have not yet done, something that you want to do, you ask yourself, this something that I'm going to say, or even this thought that I have, this thought that I'm going to have, this is something I'm going to say, or this action that I'm going to do. When I do it, it's going to cause harm to me. It's going to cause harm to others. So, you reflect. If no, then carry on. If yes, don't do it. All right. It's a very simple instruction. Very, very simple instruction. But a very precise, very direct instruction which the Buddha gave. All right. So, remember... Whatever you want to do, whether by body, by speech, or through your mind, something that you want to think, right? always ask yourself, this thing that I want to do is going to lead harm to me, it's going to lead harm to others. All right? So a very important advice to Buddha did. Buddha gave to his seven-year-old son. Right? Okay. Then Buddha gave the second advice. Now, this is, you can see the word in the middle, is called present. Is this mental, verbal, bodily action causing harm to me and others? In, in other, this is what you're currently doing. You're saying something to someone and you know that speech of yours is causing a lot of uh, what's the, uh, a lot of uh, uncertain, a lot of anxieties or fear or worry or even anger in the other person. So what should you do? Again, you assess your present action, something that you are saying. All right? If yes, stop doing it now. All right? But if something that you are saying in, 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 instead of that person who is listening, uh, becoming distraught or becoming worried, becoming anxious and angry, all right? Then if he's uh, in those positive states are already in his mind, then you can, con you can continue. So you, you know that you are actually saying things which cause harmony rather than disharmony, okay? So again, a very simple, straightforward instruction the Buddha gave, all right? So we check, all right, check. Now, the third one, here the Buddha says, you review, you review. This is something that's been done. Did this mental, verbal, bodily action cause harm to me and others? So you sat back, you reflect. Oh, something that I said yesterday, did it cause harm to Mr. So-and-so that I spoke to? All right. If... If I did, all right, then I will not do it again. If no, okay, it's a wise action. Then you can continue. All right. If you realize that yes, you uh, you did say something that was uh, that has caused distraught or fear or anxieties or worries or even anger in the minds of the other person, all right, 
there's nothing to stop you from taking the next step and tell yourself, right, okay, I should not have said it, I will not do it again, but I will ask for forgiveness. I will say, I'm sorry, you know, I should have said what I said, so I ask for forgiveness. So in other words, we wisely reflect on our actions. So here you will appreciate that by now you, I hope you understand that when we talk about wise with wise intention or wise intention, some teachers translate as wise intention, is basically on what we do, what we say, and what we think. Okay. Atisha, some, some of you know, he's a great Indian Bengali master who stayed many years in, in Indonesia and then subsequently went back to uh, to, to, to Tibet to, to actually uh, re-establish the Buddhist tradition in Tibet by starting the Kadampa tradition. Uh, Atisha has this great saying, you know, which I think is worth for us to remember. He says, in the midst of others, in the midst of others, check your speech. When alone, check your mind. This is from the precious, uh, precious garments of the Bodhisattvas, one of, the, one of those uh, Tibetan texts. So Atisha says, right? So I, I think it is, it is something worth for us to remember. In the midst of others, check our speech. So when you're in the midst of many people, whatever you say is very important, right? And uh, when you're alone, check your mind. So in the midst of others, check your speech. When alone, check your mind. Right? So I think that's a very uh, wise instruction for us to do. And how are we able to do that? It goes back to the earlier point about having mindfulness, about cultivating mindfulness, and sampajana, sati, sampajana, and atapi. So the three very important uh, key, key aspects of the Buddha's instruction. Be mindful, but mindfulness based on clear understanding and always back up by uh, effort, right? Basically, there are three samadhi factors. Right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration, okay? So as you can see, the, the, the three works together, not alone, right? So that is why in, in, in Buddhism, in fact, the, the, the Buddha explained it through his own examples that even just as mindfulness alone is not good enough, Concentration alone is also not good. You remember the Prince Siddhartha before he became the, the, the Buddha in his quest for enlightenment. He had two very great teachers, Alara Kalama and Udaka Ramakuni. He developed concentration practices, concentration uh, powers, right? As good as the two teachers. So much so that the teacher says, come, be, you are an equal to all of us. Right? So let us lead our have more disciples. And Buddha knew that that was not awakening. Right? So that was not enlightened. So basically, concentration is again by itself is not enough. So you need to have a combination of mindfulness, concentration, right effort, and within mindfulness itself, you have got clear comprehension, sampajana. So then it becomes complete. All right? Okay. So it's very important. So here, the Buddha uh, mentioned to his son, Rahula, it's called the purity of three doors. Rahula, whatever recluses and Brahmins in the past purified their bodily, verbal, and mental action, all did so by repeatedly reflecting this. Whatever recluses and Brahmins in the future will purify their bodily, verbal, and mental action, all will do so by repeatedly reflecting whatever recluses and Brahmins in the present are purifying their bodily, verbal, and mental action. All are doing so by repeatedly reflecting this. So whatever we do, if we want to put wise reflection or wise attention into practice, we always ask our, our, ourselves what we are going to do in the future in terms of our body, speech, and mind, what we are currently doing now, and what we did in the past. We reflect on all those things. So this is called purity of the three goals. Okay? So the final goal 
which is uh, which is mentioned in the Pata Pamarapasa Sutta. The Buddha says, by wise contemplation, by wise right striving. You see, I mentioned right right striving is the uh, effort, the right effort part. Right? So you must always have the effort. So wise contemplation by wise right striving. I have arrived at surpassed liberation. I have realized unsurpassed liberation. You too, by wise contemplation, by wise right striving, must arrive at unsurpassed liberation, must realize unsurpassed liberation. Okay? So here the Buddha makes it very clear that yes, we need uh, wise contemplation, but that is what will help us to penetrate what the Buddha taught right, uh, for 45 years, right? his teachings for 45 so wise contemplation. Okay, so in conclusion, I just like to mention that how do we, uh, in, you can find the details here. You know, I've given you many references. So I hope uh, um, at the end of today's talk, you'll be able to, to, to Google those the discourses and, and, then, and then get more information and then instructions on how we can practice because uh, it's a it's a forty five minutes fifteen minute talk. You know, there's so much that that you can you can benefit. But more important is, I hope the the, the references that I've given you, you know, that will be more useful than just listening to what I've I've said. Anyway, in another discourse called the Seya Sutta, which is in the book of uh, Gradual Sayings, Book of Four, the Buddha says that uh, wise attention is very important, but Wise attention must be accompanied by, for example, spiritual friendship, listening to true Dhamma, and living with Dhamma. Right? So, how do we practice wise attention? Friends are very important. It is said that wise attention is the internal friend, and the external friend will be the spiritual friends. Okay? So, that is why the, the Buddha told Ananda. Right? You remember that, that famous uh, statement the Buddha gave to Ananda in the Upada Sutta? When Ananda says that, oh, Master Gautama or Venerable or Master or Gautama, I think half the holy life comprises of spiritual friendship. And the Buddha told Ananda, no, Ananda, it's not half the spiritual life comprises of friendship. It's the entire spiritual life comprises friendship. So friendship is a very important aspect right, in the spiritual path. Then listening to the Dhamma, right? listening to the true Dhamma, Sadhamma. Sadhamma right? So many people have the impression that, uh, oh, when, when I practice Dhamma, I just practice, I just meditate. I don't need to listen to the Dhamma. I just practice. But actually, that's not, not complete. Right? If the Buddha doesn't want us to listen to the Dhamma, the Buddha wouldn't have said Pariyati, Patipati, and Pativeda, isn't it? Pariyati means studying or listening to the Dhamma. Pariyati. Patipati means we practice the Dhamma. It's only when we have uh, listened to the Dhamma, we have practiced it, then the realization will be of the true Dhamma. So always remember, it's very important to Listen to the Dhamma, right? listen to the true Dhamma. And wise attention. Okay? Once we do this, then we live with the Dhamma. We live in accordance with the Dhamma. And how do we live in accordance with the Dhamma? For example, the, the, the Buddha explains that we, we understand the law of karma, then we live with the understanding that wholesome actions or skillful actions lead to skillful or wholesome results. So we always try to make sure that our mind is focused on what is wholesome, what is useful. Okay, so that's living with Dhamma. So in conclusion, I think it's very important for us to understand that wise, wise attention is coming from our mind, but spiritual friendship, people we associate with are also very important because good spiritual friends actually encourage us to move on to further our study and practice of the Dhamma. And we do it on our own. We listen to the Dhamma. And having listened to it, we live with it. We practice it. Okay? So that's in conclusion. Right? That's my co conclusion for today's talk. So I hope uh, uh, the past uh, 15 minutes right, has been useful. 
So I hope anything that's useful, please take it with you and put it into practice. Whatever you found not useful, please leave it behind. Okay. So thank you very much uh, for your patience. And I think we have about uh, maybe 20 minutes, 25 minutes. So if there are any questions, I'll be quite uh, happy to respond. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Benny, for the very comprehensive and uh, very research talk. There's a question from Sister Siu Ling. What if the actions that we have done in the past were unintentionally harmed people, feeling due to ignorance and before we get into contact with the Dhamma, how to resolve and recorrect so that it won't haunt us now and then? Yeah. Okay, that's a good question. If, in the first place, we need to, to understand that uh, when we talk about uh, intention, right? In, in fact, in the Buddha's teachings, we always say that uh, karma is actually intention, right? If, uh, if we accidentally, for example, you know, we accidentally uh, kill an end, for example, that's, uh, that's not considered as karma in that sense, right? because we have no intention of harming the end. Yeah, through our lack of mindfulness, through our lack of carefulness, we, we hurt a particular creature. Okay. Now, the important thing is, if, we have, if in the past, we have unintentionally harmed someone due to ignorance, uh, what should we do? I think there are a couple of things that we could do. Number one, we reflect that, oh, that is a negative action that we have done in the past. So we make a strong determination or a strong effort that we will not repeat that mistake again. We will not do it again. So that's a very important uh, act on the path. Now, the second thing that we could do is to actually uh, meet this particular person and apologize for whatever we did in the past due to our ignorance. Saying that if we did it due to ignorance, it was unintentional, we really I'm sorry for it. We ask for forgiveness. We ask for forgiveness. All right? Forgiveness is a very important teaching in Buddhism, isn't it? Forgiveness. I think the Pali word is kama. Uh, not, not kama as in K-A-M-M-A. -M -M -A, it's K-H-A-M-A, -A, kama. So the word, in, the word forgiveness, you know, we, if we develop a mind of forgiveness, we actually never know Sometimes we may not even know that we have actually harmed someone in the past, all right? So that, that is why it is always good, especially even among friends, when we are departing, you know, we always say, oh, you know, I, I, I seek your forgiveness. If you, if, you, if you observe, for example, among monks, the monastics, when they stay together in a particular monastery, maybe for a few weeks, for a few months, or even for a few years. And after some time, one of the monks, if they were to leave the monastery, maybe to go to another place, they, they will say, they will ask for forgiveness. All right, if in the past I've done something wrong, please forgive me. So I think forgiveness is a very important practice that we can do. So we can uh, resolve and recorrect that by going back to uh, It is important not to cling on to what we have we have done, uh, whatever negative thing we have done in the past. Because whatever has been done in the past, it has been done. We should let go. We should let it go. We should not uh, let it haunt us. We should not let it haunt us. If we know that it is something that is not wholesome, yes, we acknowledge it was not wholesome. We promise ourselves we will not do it again. At the same time, if we know who the person that we have wronged, we should make the effort to approach that person and apologize and ask for forgiveness. Thank you. Yeah, Th thank you, Benny. Benny, you mentioned a lot about the importance of having spiritual friendship. Can you suggest some ways in which we can uh, have more developed on this area? Well, uh, how, how, how do we know that we have got uh, good spiritual friends, right? So one way is, we will see, we need to uh, be with whoever that person is for, for a period of time to, to understand his character. Right? If you do not know that person's character, 
then we will not know whether is he going to be a spiritual friend. He can still be a friend, a, a, a very a normal friend. But uh, we're talking about a spiritual friend, then, then we need to really uh, associate with him for a certain period of, of time. For example, has he got the, 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 the same kind of uh, frame of reference in terms of uh, appreciating the Dharma? Right? Has he got the same frame of reference of at least you know, appreciating, observing the precepts? Okay? Because if you associate with someone of like-mindedness, someone who has the same kind of thinking, same kind of uh, perception, like for example, he also thinks that uh, we should not harm living beings, we should not take things which are not given, we should have contentment. Then you know that those are the ingredients that will help to go towards uh, having someone as a spiritual friend. Okay? Another way of, of knowing whether a person is a spiritual friend is, or how to develop a spiritual friend is that he is open to uh, suggestions, he's open to be reprimanded for things which are not uh, wholesome, you know. So then, then, you know, for example, he may have done something that is not wholesome, that is not skillful. And then when you highlight this to him or her, he or she then realize that, oh, yes, yes, uh, I shouldn't have done that. So he, he realized that there was a mistake. And because of that, he makes, an, an, he makes amends to improve himself. Then you know that is someone that you can associate with. Because if, 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 if not, then you may also be influenced by him. Especially, you know, if he's someone who doesn't observe precepts, you know, he, he doesn't believe in, in what is wholesome, you know, then it's going to be very difficult. Unless you have a, you are a very strong will bodhisattva, you know, you really, you, you want to go out and, you know, to, to, to save as many sentient beings as you possibly can. And it's, Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank. Thank you, Benny. Uh, question from Brother A. L. Chan. If we have done foolish things like not being filial piety to our parents who are no longer around, how do we repent and learn to be a wiser person? So you have done foolish things. Okay, like not being filial to our parents, and now they are no more with us. Okay. Then how do we repent? Uh, how do we learn to be a wiser person? Then, in the first place, just as my response to the first question, first place, we have to acknowledge that what we did in the past was not correct, was not in accordance with the Dhamma, was not living with the Dhamma, right? Because in the in the Tata Anyu Sutta, the Buddha says, you know, our parents, uh, that it is that, you know, our, our, we should always be, we should always have gratitude to our parents. That it is almost impossible to repay what our parents have given us, right? In the discourse called the Katahanyu Sutta, the, the discourse of gratitude, where the Buddha specifically mentioned about parents. Yes, you know, our parents, you know, they are our parents, we, we are supposed to take care of them. Yes, as when we were young, they take care of us, right? So now they are, they are, they are old, so we need to take care of them. But here the, 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 the question is, uh, in the past, we have not taken care of our parents and, and now they are no longer with us, okay? So, first thing is we have to reflect deeply that what we did was not right. Okay? We should have done something better. Now, how do we do some, something better, All right? Then, we learn to practice kindness and compassion. Our parents are no longer with us, but we can still practice compassion and kindness to other relatives of ours. We still have relatives, right? And the fact that they are our relatives, they could be our, our uncles, they could be our sisters, is because of our karmic affinity. That's why they become our brothers and sisters, or our uncles and aunties, right? Or our parents. Why did someone become our parents? Because of our past karmic affinity, right? So we have that karmic affinity. So now our parents are no more with us, and we realize that in the past we have been good to them. So with that realization, we can make amends, all right? We have, maybe we still have uncles now, we still have aunties around. Sometimes, you know, we may not have parents, we may still have grandparents around. 
So what do we do? Do we show kindness? Do we show compassion? Do we show our affection for them? Do we help them in so many ways? Okay. Or the other way is we continue to, to, to think of them each time when we do meritorious action. Okay. Like, uh, you know, my, my, I just lost my dad a couple of months ago, you know, so each time when I do reflection, when I do sharing of merits, you know, I will, I will always share with my, with my departed uh, father and say, you know, and, and make an aspiration that wherever he may be reborn, may he be reborn well and happy, may he be free from affliction, may he be free from suffering until he finally attained the place of Nirvana. So we can have that, we can radiate that kind of uh, thoughts of loving kindness, compassion, and, and and love to show that we that we care. Yes, they may not be with us physically, but if we are Buddhists, we believe that they are they are somewhere right, in another realm of, of, of existence. And in Buddhist cosmology, we talk about thirty one planes of existence. So our our parents, if they are no more with us, they are reborn somewhere else, right? They are born somewhere else. So we share merits with them. We wish them well. Okay. So, so we, in that sense, I think we learn to be a wiser. Okay. I think that's another question. Can I take that next question? Yeah, thank you, Ben. How do How we do implement we... wise reflection amidst day-to-day -day activities at home and at work? Examples of, uh, any examples of doing wise reflection? Hmm. Well, I think the Buddha's advice to his son, Rahula, we can actually apply that in our everyday life. Know, everyday activity, for example, at home, you know, it's, and a lot of this has got to do with our speech. If you notice, isn't it? Speech, isn't it? that is why you, you notice in the, for example, in the eightfold part, you, you find that right speech actually stands out on its own. Isn't it? Do you realize that you've got right views, uh, right thoughts, and then you land under the morality section. You've got right action, right, uh, right livelihood, and then you've got right speech. So speech in itself it stands out, see? Okay, and, and there are many, many teachings the Buddha gave about speech, the importance of speech. And just now I mentioned to you what uh, Atisha Dipankara says, but in the midst of others, right, check your speech. When, in, when alone, check your mind. Right? So that's a great instruction, great advice from from from, uh, from from Atisha. So how do we practice wise reflection? I think one good example is the speech. Now, before we say something to our spouse, to our children, all right, uh, do we just react or do we respond? Now, these are two very important words. If you have practiced mindfulness, then you learn not to react, but you learn to respond. So in other words, you are quick enough to have that gap where instead of, for example, the spouse or your even your, your brother or your, or your son may have said something that upsets you. So the natural tendency is to resp is to react, right, with another unpleasant word. Maybe to react with anger. But if you have practiced mindfulness, we are, it is said that then we are able to respond. In other words, there's a very short pause. Before we say something, we think, by so saying, am I going to aggravate the situation? Is it going to make the situation worse? It's going to end up escalating the whole conversation into a kind of a small quarrel? Or should I say something? Maybe by asking, by the way, are you trying to clarify what he actually meant? Because when you do that, that person who was initially agitated when he said something, he also would back off. Because now you're asking him to explain. <laughs> you are not responding with anger to something like that. So that's an example of wise attention because it's from the mind, isn't it? But you can only do that if you uh, have practiced mindfulness. So it's very important for us to uh, practice mindfulness. So for those of you who have practiced mindfulness, I think you know what I'm saying. For those who have not, but you think it's worthwhile giving it a thought, I think two weeks' time you have this talk by. Uh, uh, Sile Tama, right? On, on what is not mindfulness. So I'm sure in that talk she's going to explain to you how we can actually. So I think you can, you can, 
can do that. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you, Benny. Another question from Sister Lailin. Sometimes I feel I have to face a lot of challenges and I'm lost during those times. Example, there'll be occasions where I'll stop from doing good and sometimes one particular person will appear and create trouble in the midst of me having a calm and happy atmosphere. If I cannot be... Uh, okay, never mind. There's another question from Laili. So, so, what's the question? Sometimes I feel that I have to face a lot of challenges and I'm lost during those times. Okay, example, there will be occasion when I will stop from doing good and sometimes one particular group will appear and create trouble in the midst of the come and come. So, okay, I think we have to realize that as long as we are in samsara, nothing is perfect. So we have to accept that. Okay, and when we work in an, work in an environment, we cannot expect that that environment to be like, you know, like a retreat environment when you're attending, you know, you go for a, maybe a one week retreat, everybody is very nice to you. Everybody, everybody says, sadu, sadu, sadu. It's time for lunch, everybody offer you lunch and even ask you, do you have enough? Do you need more food? Do you need enough drinks? In real life, that doesn't happen. Okay, that's why we need the Dharma. So the Dharma actually shows us how to respond to difficult situations, all right? In, in fact, there's a beautiful book I recommend you to, to read by an, an, an American uh, nun from the Tibetan tradition. Her name is uh, Bema, Tro Bema Children. You can Google that, Bema Children. The book is called When Things Fall Apart. It, it, it's, the, it's the title of, of the book, When Things Fall Apart. In real life, things always fall apart. Right. Even when you want to do something good, you know, maybe Mara will appear, you know, in Buddhist, in Buddhist, uh, in Buddhist scriptures, you try to do something good, somebody will appear and say, hey, why, why, why are you doing that? You try to help someone, you know, I say, why, why, why are you help, helping them? You know, that, that's the government's job. You don't waste your, your time. And then the issue of race will come in. So even you say, oh, yeah, maybe I shouldn't do it. So you, then you, you miss that opportunity to, to actually do something good. So it is very important for us to have faith, F-A-I-T-H, faith, satta, faith in doing good. If we really believe that what we do is beneficial, again, wise attention. Is that something that we do? Is it going to be beneficial to oneself, beneficial to the other party? If it is, let's, let's do it. Irrespective of what people say, it doesn't matter. All right, so you are very calm and you're very happy. All right, maybe some people don't, don't, don't like the idea to when they notice that you're calm and happy, right? Because they are not calm and, and happy. All right, so do you want to, to give them that opportunity to make you unhappy? All right, it, it's just like, for example, you know, uh, someone has said something terrible to you, all right, and you refuse to forgive him. He has said something, he said, oh, you know, I've not seen you for, you know, for five months since the lockdown, you know, I've, oh, you look so fat now, you look, you're so fat. Oh, you never, for, you never forgive her for saying that to you. you know? he said, I'll never forgive, how can you ever say that I'm so fat now, right? But that person who said that, she's, she, she's gone, she's no more there, you know? After two days, you're still thinking about that. Three days, you're thinking about that. So one week, one month, you say, I'll never forgive her for saying that I'm fat. Actually, that person has already gone to Bahamas for holiday. He's enjoying, she or she already enjoying herself. And this person, you are still, still feeling sad about. So you should let go. <laughs> so that's why in, in Buddhist teachings, we always talk about you let go. What is it that you let go? You let go about all those thoughts that arise. Thoughts that arise, they fall away. The thoughts are impermanent. Thoughts are transient. Thoughts are subject to change, right? So that thought, that that expression of saying that you're fat, that you are ugly. When she said you're fat, that means she's implying that you're ugly, right? So so you 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 form that you form your mind proliferate. She said I'm fat, so I'm now ugly. You never forgive her for, for that. So if we don't, then who's who has the pain? Who has the suffering? You suffer, isn't it? You suffer. 
Okay, the, the Buddha gave the example, you know, like you're shot by two arrows. Have you heard of this simile? The parable of the two arrows in the Salata Sutta. You can, you can Google that. It's in the Salata Sutta. The Buddha says, it's like, you know, maybe, you know, you, you have, it's true that you, you've been in lockdown, you have not been exercising for the past six months or five months, you've been eating and sleeping, no exercise, so you definitely have, have grown fat. Or you don't like the word fat, you can say, I've been horizontally enhanced. Yeah? People like to use a politically correct word. So I'm now horizontally enhanced. So that's the first arrow, isn't it? It's the first arrow. The second arrow is when someone says, hey, you are now so fat. That's the second arrow. All right, that's the second arrow. The second arrow is your reaction, your reaction to what people say. So if you reflect wisely, whatever that person say, you reflect, number one, what he says is true. Well, it's true. If it is true, it is true. If what he says is not true, why bother? He's mistaken, isn't it? So then you, you, you tune your mind, you tune your attitude changes, you look at things in a very positive manner. Then you continue to maintain a calm and happy atmosphere. Okay? All right? Oh, okay. Yeah. Lailin, you got another question? I still cannot believe that there is no God but only universe. Well, you can continue to believe. There's no question about it. There's nothing wrong. You want to believe. Because the word belief means that you do not know. You believe in something because you do not know. If, for example, you know, maybe, I don't know, you've been listening to Dhamma Talks, or so oh, maybe Benny is a good guy, you know, whatever he says, probably he will not lie to us. And if I, come, if I say to you now, I show you my hand, I say, in my, in my hand, I've got five little gem, precious gem, five precious gem, jewels. Can you see it? You can't see it, right? You can't see it. So do you know? You do not know. So if I say I've got five little precious gems in my hand, you do not know, isn't it? Because you, you could not see it. But if you trust me, you believe me, you say, oh, yeah, yeah, I believe you. But can you say I know? You can't, right? You can say I believe you. You cannot say I know you've got five gems in your hand because you really do not know. But the moment I open my hand, you see it really. You see the gem. Do you say, I believe that you got five, five jewels? You do not use the word believe anymore. You say, I know you got five gems. You get what I mean? So in Buddhism, we said people, they believe in God, fine. No problem. Because they do not know. They do not know. So they want to believe in God, no problem. They want to believe in Yahweh, no problem. They want to believe in Allah, no problem. They can call God by any name, you know. You can, you can believe in Brahma. You know, in the, in the Tevija Sutta, the Buddha says, the Buddha asks this Brahmin, you said you, you believe in this God. Have you seen this God? No. Have your parents seen this God? No. Have your parents' parents seen this God? No. So, how do you know there's God? Oh, I believe. Okay, you can continue to, to believe, but you do not know. <laughs> All right? And in the first discourse of the Buddha, in the long discourse section in the Dikha Nikaya called the Brahma Jala Sutta, the Buddha says that the, the belief that there is an all-powerful God, an all-omnipotent God, that is one of the 62 wrong views. <laughs> so there are 62 wrong views. And one of it is, is God. There are actually many discourses where the Buddha uh, debunk this concept of a creator God. Right? In the Buridatta Jataka, the Buddha said, if there's a God who is all so powerful, so omnipotent, why does he allow so much suffering in this world? Why? What is if, if you say this, there's this God who is so powerful, so merciful, and he allows so much suffering in this world, then it's either he is all powerful, but he's not merciful. Or he's very merciful, but he's not powerful. You get my point? So, so when you say there's a God, so you always ask yourself, 
What is this God? You always think God is powerful, omnipotent, and God is very kind, merciful, compassionate. So in the Buddhist scriptures, the Buddha says, if there's such a God, why did he allow so much suffering in this world? And today you can see this, you can see the suffering. You can see the Palestinians and the Israelis they have been fighting since when? Before your grandparents are born. <laughs> they have been fighting. Did God create them to fight? Something is wrong. Right? So, so, there's, so because of, of, of this, many intelligent people don't realize that, um, well, there's universe, but uh, very hard to say whether there's. But you want to believe in, in God. No, it's not a, not a problem. It's not a problem. Important thing is not God. Important thing is whether are you able to have peace and happiness in your everyday life. And how can the Dharma help you to uh, accomplish that? Okay. All right. Any, any final questions? Benny, one question. The secular mindfulness and uh, uniso manasikara. Mm. Does secular mindfulness have these factors? <laughs> the, the, I think the best, because of time, the best. Uh, let, let me respond to you by saying that the best answer you, you will get will be a talk which uh, Eastern Horizon is organizing. Uh, in December with Venerable Arya Damika and Venerable Tutan Children about what is right mindfulness. And in that session, we will talk about secular mind, mind, mindfulness. Secular mindfulness would obviously have all the necessary ingredients uh, that you find in, for example, cultivating uh, uh, a very focused mind, you know, uh, you know, where, 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 where you can be very focused in doing what you need to do. But secular mindfulness may not have the aspects of the ethical dimension. Ethical dimension. Because when you talk about sati, samasati, the right mindfulness as taught in the Noble Eightfold Path, sati, samasati cannot be divorced, cannot be extricated from Sila is part, it is part of the Eightfold Path, right? Secular mindfulness can do without Sila. That is why in the West, for example, uh, you have got mindfulness which has been used to train soldiers to be snipers so that they can kill the enemy with precision. You, you, you know about that, right? So that in the, in the, in the military, you know, they are, the soldiers have been trained on how to be mindful. Because when you're very mindful, you can be very focused. All right? So you, you do not just have a, have a... You don't simply react. Right? You know how to respond very quickly in an appropriate manner. All right? But when you, when you take out the ethical dimension, then that cannot be sati cannot be Sama Sati, it cannot be right mindfulness as propounded in the global world. Remember at the beginning I said mindfulness by itself is incomplete. Right? Mindfulness must always be back up with another word which in Pali is called Sampajana. In Sampajana, the root word itself comes from the word Anya, wisdom. And in Buddhism, wisdom always linked to, again, sila, samadhi, and which is morality. So you cannot divorce morality from this. Okay? So for details, that what I'm telling you is just the appetizer, right? the, the, the real stuff, right? Venerable Arika, Arya Damika and Venerable I've, in, I've invited a Theravada monk of long-standing and a Tibetan Buddhist nun of long-standing. So, I think uh, please keep a lookout for, for that uh, for that talk. Okay. Okay. Maybe that's the last question. Maybe we I'll just take the last question. It's already eleven thirty.
Yes, I do always question the God about the injustice and suffering, but I'm also amazed with the great evolution in this world and wonder who is the creator behind all this. The creator is man himself. That is why the, the Malay word manusa, manusia, comes from the word mano, which means the mind. The Buddha says that this mind of ours we, 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 is, is capable of doing fantastic things stuff. We can do whatever we want with the mind. Right? That, that is why it is said that the, the Prince Siddhartha, if he developed his mind, he could be a universal monarch or he could be a great being like the, like the Buddha. Right? So, you know, many things, for example, today in, in, in science, in, especially in the field of neuroplasticity, in the field of uh, neuroscience, you find that a lot of things which is found in the Buddhist scriptures, in the, in the, in the Buddhist teachings on mind science, is now coming true, right? So that is, that is because all, all the great masters of the past, you know, can you imagine the mind of, of the Buddha, the mind of great people like Atisha, Nagarjuna, or even Buddha Gosha, the great Pali commentator. So in the, it's how they focus their mind. The man is capable of that. That's why man could, could land on the moon right? because it is our mind. Okay. Right. So can Yoniso Manasekara be used to achieve and enhance? Oh, definitely. Okay. We use Yoniso Manasekara for all wholesome actions, remember? Right? Anything that is wholesome, right, that's focused. We use that definitely cultivating loving kindness, cultivating compassion. Right, we, we use your so much, especially equanimity. Okay, 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 Benny. Thanks, yeah. thanks for clarifying all the questions. Let us now end with a short sharing of merits and uh, making our aspirations.